Hey, everybody. Hi. Hello. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Hope everybody's New Year's gone well so far. I'm going to call the meeting to order, seven o'clock. Um, do we have any public participation? Sorry, did someone speak? Okay. Let me share the agenda. Oops. Okay, can everybody see the agenda? All right. Yes. Yes. And we now have a quorum, so we can do votes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, so next item is to approve the minutes from December. So moved. Second. All right, uh, Tiana. Yes. Ann. Yes. Tom. Yes. Sean. Aye. Julie. Yes. Uh, William. Yes. Robin. Yes. And Chris. Uh, I'll abstain since I was not at the last meeting. Okay. All right, minutes are approved. Hold on, hold on. Um, oh no, Julie joined, so that now we have a quorum to vote. Okay, with the abstain, we almost didn't have enough to accept it, but we're good. All right. Um, so next item on the agenda, um, we discussed last time about um, ESC's support for the new high school design. Um, so. Uh, with Robin and Julie's help, um, put together uh, a motion. Um, can you guys see this or are you still seeing the agenda? We see the agenda. All right. Um, so this is um, basically a motion uh, for ESC's um, support of the, the new high school project. Um, we specifically put in the uh, key sustainability aspects of the design that we are supporting. Um, so I'll give you guys a couple minutes to read it over. Um, so one of the, I guess one of the questions is, uh, do we want to say outright that we support the, the high school project? Do we want to say we only support the sustainability aspects of it? I um, wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, personally, I think it has more teeth if we say we support the project as a whole and then call out the sustainability aspects. So I, I really like the way it's written here. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, we kind of the sustainability parts are part of the project. So, uh, you know, where I would say as written, we're in support of the project and the, you know, calling out the sustainability. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm in favor of this. I like it. I do too. We just might want to like even 
footnote the things that are abbreviated lead mm -hmm. and um, maybe a link to what lead is and uh, we can spell okay. it MSBA. Okay. And do we want to, does it make it clear to just add in particular before we support just so that it's clear we're particularly interested in those, but we're not saying we don't support other aspects of it, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. To, in, in the footnotes, you know, um, maybe link for the net zero, link that back to the to the states, um, you know, 2050 net zero um, as well, you know, what the silver, um, I'm just trying to think of what other resources potentially could be linked to. Well, if you're including links to sources, I would include the submission itself. <laughs> yes. Good point, Good point Robin. The, the obvious one. Yeah, I think that's great because I think we may be reaching audiences who are not kind of seeped in this and it will give them a way to go back and look at things. That's a great suggestion. Do we want to mention anything about the energy park more broadly? So that was actually in one of the drafts. And because that's not voted in connection to this, um, I discouraged us too. So it's not confusing on what the um, special town meeting is about. We already voted on the energy park. And I, I mean, Tom, tell me if I'm telling anything wrong, but it, yeah, it no, is I, already I, approved. So yeah, I agree with you. You know, the, the, while the energy park is a substantial part of making the high school net zero ready, it is a separate project um, that's outside of the scope of the high school. If that kind of makes sense. Um, the, the energy park, you know, will will be built um, to support both schools, and you know, more than likely, it will be built even if the high school is not passed at town meeting um, because there's still major renovations that will need to be done and more than likely that those renovations will include electrification so the energy park is not incumbent on this passing town meeting so i would tend to agree with with robin that it confuses this but and there might be a later time when we're trying to get this through the home rule that we do weigh in but I think it's fine to not do it now. Ye yes. Okay, so we wanna tie this net zero to the state schools. Is that what we said? Yeah. Um, did I miss anything else? You wanted to link the design, the actual design? Yes, yeah, schematic design submission, I believe, is on the project website. And if you can't find it, let me know. I can send you the shortcut. I mean, to that point, should the, like, in the first sentence project link to the project website? Also, if folks want to learn more. Yeah, um, I, I guess, guess the design, the submission itself might be more detailed than some people would necessarily want to dig into. So, so this motion would be uh, basically uh, an attachment to the post of notes for this meeting, right, Robin? Well, I was actually, that was what I was just about to ask is, how do you do footnotes or links to a motion um so is it truly a footnote so it just goes below the line so to speak um which is then attached to the meeting minutes or yeah, yeah i would i don't have experience with this <laughs> at least i would say you know put you know the very first one put the footnote one footnote two footnote three and then underneath you know the footnote spell out the entire link right because this will be more than likely a printed document versus an online document for someone to click on. Right. So okay. how they 
printed document? What do you mean by that? It's PDF. I think that's what he meant by like to have printed. It's, it's it's dumb. You know, it's not necessarily a live, right? Yeah. So if this gets printed in, say, you know, the the item or somewhere, it's not necessarily an online document where you know you can just have a hyperlink embedded into the the word. Okay. I would format it with the you know traditional footnote, you know, with the um, superscript of one, two, three, four, right, and having the actual full link um, spelled out in the footnote. So we shouldn't add links? I mean, you can, but I would I would say add, it, it would be duplicative, but- Yeah, so, I would do both. I think yeah. I would do both. Because sometimes, PD, sometimes PDFs do maintain the, um, the link ability. Um, sometimes they don't. I mean, if we put this in the newspaper, for example, which I think we should talk we just about. Add the website, not a clickable link. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, is there any other uh, sustainability aspects of the project that are not listed here that you want to put in here? That you know of? These are the major ones. So. There's a, there's a lot of smaller little things. Um, we don't, I mean, we don't specifically say solar, which I know is not, is that because it's not the, done? Well, the project isn't necessarily the one providing the solar. Uh, correct. Exactly, yeah. that, that's what I'm which, which is why I, yeah, that was on one of the drafts and I suggested not, again, for the same oh, reason as the energy oh, part. So the net zero ready is, is indirectly connected to that. Um, okay. And the code requires it to be solar ready. So, they have to have at least that. Yeah. I mean, I think if we do take this out, you know, if we do kind of put a statement out on this, we can kind of talk about some of the other things as well. I mean, I realize there won't be a direct statement, but we could probably mention a few of the other things too, like, including the green communities, which we'll talk about later, which we now have, you know, just like how important this is going to be, um, how this is, you know, we'll be able to utilize this now that we're a green community and things like that. Do we want to, I mean, this, I was envisioning this to be kind of short, so. No, this would definitely, I, I think this is what we vote on, but I'm saying okay. like if, we, if we end up doing any additional, you know, if we just are out talking to people, we can bring, we can talk about those other things as well. Oh, got it. Robin, do you know, is, is there any like major embodied carbon, um, construction methodologies or anything being con considered in that that would be potentially notable here notable no um i did talk to them about you know how much they're paying attention to it um and at the time i don't believe they ran any of the the calculations on it there's now software and stuff like that so it's part of the conversation but it's not a bar um okay that can be measured at the moments that they've made public. So, and there's been no request of it meeting a certain level. Uh, it was, I presented it as like, we need to have that conversation because that's kind of where the market is at the moment, you know. Okay, yeah, that was the only, I mean, I think we've covered everything here. Um, outside of that would be the only thing that I can think of. Okay, so should I update, make these changes and then we'll vote on them at the next meeting? No, I think that the links aren't part of the motion, they're supplemental to it. So the actual okay. motion, correct me if I'm wrong folks, that is, is these two sentences or whatever. It's how it gets used, I think, is the suggestions on the, the footnotes. Yeah, exactly. I would definitely say we need to vote on this today so that we have it for people going into the 28th. Okay. 
Is there a motion? Someone asked. Can I make the motion or somebody else has to? Someone else has to. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I move that we adopt this motion as written here. Mm -hmm. I second. All right, do a round table. Tiana? Enthusiastically, yes. Tom? Aye, yes. Sean? Yes. Robin? Yes. Dan? Yes. Ann? Yes. Chris? Yes. William? Uh, yes. Julie? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion passes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for you of you who got together to write this. Really good. It was mostly Robin, so. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't get credit. Robin. All, job, all Robin, great job. Oh no, Melissa, you started it. <laughs> like that's <laughs> the best way to start is someone just put words on. <laughs> I do think, I mean, maybe we'll talk later in the committees, you know, we definitely wanna get the word out on this too. So maybe our community education group can work on that. Okay, um, next item is we have some guests. Um, Aaron and Jim have joined us to talk about the MBTA community working group. Um, so I'll kind of just, Jim, I'll kick it off how I did last night with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Hi, everyone. Um, I've heard many of your names before and met a number of you too and in person and either through a, a meeting. So thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm thrilled to have Jim Hogan from the planning board, our vice chair here as well. Um, we've been working really close, not only on just day-to-day um, -day planning board initiatives, but um, something that's been coming through the pipeline over the last year has been this MBTA communities um, slash 3A. You've probably heard them called both if you're familiar with it. It's been all over the news. Um, so we're here to kind of give you an update of where we're at, what we're kind of looking for from your group, um, and really just building this relationship moving forward as we kind of go through this planning process um, to be in compliance uh, with the state. This is a state regulation um, by the end of December 2024. And Jim has put a wonderful presentation together and can kind of go into more detail for yourselves and any guests that might be on this call to learn more and more details about exactly what 3A is and what MBTA community is. So I'm going to hand it over to Jim, who um, can introduce himself again and uh, kind of give you a, a quick presentation of why we're here tonight. So thank you. Hi, Jim Hogan, as Aaron mentioned, thank you to the Environmental Sustainability for having us and for uh, for listening. Um, I, I'd ask, do you mind if I share my screen for to present the the power, the deck I have? Yeah, I just made you co-host. Perfect. Thank you very much. Give me one second. Um, yes. Well, so you probably have to stop. Oh, oh. There we go. Um, so Again, Vice Chairman of the Planning Board, uh, Jim Hogan. Uh, thank you guys very much for for, uh, for listening to us. Before I get into the actual presentation, for any members of the public who may be seeing this or the recording after, um, if you want to learn more, we're, we have a series of open answer quick question and answer sessions that are being hosted by the Planning Board to introduce and allow for public comment. The next one is scheduled for January 24th, and the, there's a third one scheduled for February 28th. We had our first kickoff. Uh, in mid-December. Uh, so as Aaron mentioned, this is uh, the MBTA Community Multifamily Zoning Requirements, otherwise known as 3A. The purpose of the meeting, the reason why we're coming here today is to inform your group uh, as it relates to what's been going on, some of the uh, efforts and as to date, the process that we're talking about in terms of what we're having to, to conform to, and to request a volunteer from your group to join a working group that we're in the process of assembling in order to help define the initial uh, proposed zoning district. What this is, is we mentioned this is a state uh, law that was passed that requires the creation of a 
multifamily zoning district within each town and city that's serviced by the MBTA where multifamily housing is permitted as of right. So right now, the multifamily districts that we have require a special permit that is not allowable for to achieve conformance to this. The zoning that was, was required does not guarantee additional development, but um, you know it does make it allowable. So just for as an example, this is a GIS map that was developed in-house by Wakefield staff for a previous version of the zoning to kind of give a sense of what the scale would be. Since that time, the regulations have been updated. So probably about half of the, what you're being shown on the screen is the size that we're talking about for the zoning district. Um, but Wakefield specifically, we'd have to have a minimum size of 114 acres within half a mile from our either one of our two commuter rail spots or some splitting and combination of the two. It has to be suitable for families and a maximum of 10% affordable um, is allowable for the zoning district. The, the states explicitly mentioned that this is intended to try to encourage the development of market rate housing. We do still have the ability to have what's called the site plan approval, which is a process where you can review architecture, vehicular access, screening, et cetera, but it's not discretionary in nature. It's commenting on those things, um, but you, you can't say no just because it's a housing development. You know, other zoning requirements are acceptable if they're consistent with the, the surrounding zoning. Height, for example, being a good, good, uh, good example. Um, and then, you know, kind of what happens if we don't comply and we say we don't care? The state, in addition to making this a mandate, they've also attached some sticks for nonconformance. Um, specifically, these housing or these uh, grant programs, housing choice initiative, local capital project fund, mass work infrastructure funds. To date, in the past three years, Wakefield's received about three and a half million dollars to shade over it through these programs. And we would be cut off if we did not conform. Anecdotally, there's a series of interim compliance uh, milestones. Wakefield's actually already achieved it, but some other communities had not. And they'd already received letters from the state saying that their housing authorities were going to lose funding, which caused them to scramble and then get in conformance. So we think that the state town leadership believes that the state is serious about these requirements and serious about the potential impacts to funding. So in terms of the, the process that's going on right now, so far the planning board, we have a series of question and answers to educate the public about what this is, tell people that this is coming. We anticipate sometime early 2023, somewhere in March, that the planning board will be presented to town council and requesting the commission of a working group now, this red bullet point, this is where we the ask comes into you guys. We've developed uh, what we think is a, a good list of working group folks to sit together, kind of define the, the process of what that zoning district will want to be. And so we, we expect that to convene in on or about April 1st and then work for a, a series of sessions to define the vision, work with town staff to come up with an initial zoning group. And then after that, go to a public process that we st we're still trying to figure out exactly what that would look like, which would allow us to then incorporate any feedback from the public, make edits, and vote at town meeting to implement this zoning. The zoning must be in place by December 31st, 2024, in order to stay in conformance and avoid being cut off from all those different funding sources I referenced earlier. So for this working group, what does that look like? You know, we on or about April 1st, we'd want to convene. We've engaged a third party consultant who's actually assisting Aaron and myself in trying to help define what the process looks like in terms of what is being decided at the working group sessions. How does that interact with town staff? We actually develop the, the nuts and bolts, nitty gritty details and allow some sort of review session with the working group. So we expect this to be an iterative process, you know, lasting between three and four months, you know, multiple meetings over those, those that time frame. Again, we're still working, trying to figure out exactly what is the most effective manner to do this. We have the third party consultant that we've been, uh, this is the grant that we've secured. Uh, once we engage with him a little bit more, um, we're hoping to nail down that, that working group process a little bit more firm. But right now, talking to the different stakeholders, or the different folks within town leadership, we think that the this working group would wanna be two members of the planning board, two members of the town council 
representative of the Zoning Board of Appeals, which we made the same presentation to last night, a member of your committee, and then uh, having Aaron help keeping us all focused and uh, on the straight and narrow in terms of where we're going. So, you know, that's that we don't need any answers right now. We just wanted to present this to you guys, give us an update of what's going on and kind of yeah, raise it that we're going to be having an ask of a volunteer, um, hopefully from you guys, if you guys are amenable to that, to be a part of this working group so we can help define the zoning district before we go out to the public and solicit feedback on what that end deliverable ends up being. So with that being said, more than happy to take any questions that you guys may have. I know there's a lot to digest right there. Um, we've been, Aaron and I have been trying to get our arms around it for about six months to a year. So it's it's been something that's been oncoming for a while, but there's definitely a lot to it. So you said it'd be a series of meetings. Um, how often do you think uh, this group would meet? So that's that's honestly that's that's the component we're trying to figure out right now. We're trying to figure out what makes sense. You know, if it makes sense to have something biweekly, um, you know, in order to allow enough time between the working group meeting and then town staff to implement or do any of the studies that we need to be. That's kind of my baseline assumption, but we're trying to figure out with our third party consultant what other towns are doing. It double edged sword. It sounds like we're a little ahead of where a lot of other people are, um, which is good because it means we're finding ourselves some time on the back end, but bad because we don't have a good template of what other folks are doing. Okay. Um, I just had a thought and I lost it. If it comes back to me, I'll, I'll bring it up. Could you yeah, I think you? Going to, go ahead. Sorry. Who's the consultant? Um, so the gentleman's name is, I'm sorry, I couldn't see who asked that question. Um, is Ezra Glenn, was that you, Julie? No. No, it was oh. Robin. Robin. Oh, okay. Um, his name is Ezra Glenn. He has actually done some work already with our zoning board of appeals. Um, we haven't signed any sort of scope of work um, yet with him yet with him yet because he's putting it together for us and needs it to get approved through the mass housing partnership. Um, but he, like I said, has done work with the ZBA, so is familiar with Wakefield and some of the multifamily projects we've seen already uh, through our 40 B not ours, but through the 40B process. Um, and he's a professor at MIT, so has a, a pretty uh, comprehensive background on urban planning and um, has done some work with the state, and um, but is an outside consultant, so isn't tied, um, you know, isn't a regional planning agency or anything like that, so. And the other thing I would add that's nice is that uh, Ezra has some experience with some of the, the tools there's a compliance model that you have to do that involves some GIS modeling. Um, we're hoping to utilize him to help train some of the staff in town so we can utilize internal resources to make it a more iterative and um, te teach a town to fish instead of giving a, a town to fish, so to speak. Yeah, and I think too, going back to the meetings and what the commitment is, um, I think we could probably give you a better idea like, is it gonna be doing a lot of work at the beginning while we have his expertise of us meeting with him? And um, is that, you know, we meet for five hours one day and, um, you know, try to capitalize on having, having his expertise and then they kind of dwindle from there um, and trying to get a lot done at the beginning. Um, so I think we're just kind of wait, kind of in the waiting game right now. We could probably have a better answer um, in a few weeks of what that might look like. And are you looking for someone that has like a certain background or experience? I think one of the reasons why we identified the sustainability committee is that we felt as if if we were going to be convening uh, a, a working group to talk about strategically where we want to site and what are some of the other uh, impacts of multifamily zoning within the town. We thought that sustainability was a major lens that we'd want to make sure was brought into that. And so we, I think, specifically from the, the participation of this board, there's no uh, other uh, qualification that we'd necessarily be looking for besides the, that focus on sustainability. Obviously, if anyone has um, relevant experience in other aspects of zoning, construction, development, you know, that's obviously welcome, but I don't think that's a, a requirement per se. Yeah. 
And if people are interested, who, who exactly do they reach out to? Or is it just to um, you, Erin? Yeah, you can send me an email. Um, sorry, it's not here, but it's pretty straightforward. Ecokind.wakefield.ma.us. Um, and just let me know um, the ZBA the same thing they didn't give us an answer last night they kind of are going to talk amongst themselves and figure out you know who may be interested or who's kind of studied this a little bit um, already and I'm just curious uh, is this group familiar with the MBTA communities in 3A already okay um, and so um, so yeah we don't you know, once we have an idea of who has the time and would be interested you can just send me an email and we'll kind of talk about next steps once we have that figured out ourselves. Anything else? I think that's all we have, Jim, right? Yep. Yeah. If you guys don't have any other questions, then, you know, thank you very much for your time. You know, we look forward if, if you guys uh, would, if anyone's interested, uh, we look forward to having you guys on this working group when we get it convened and uh, working on this process. And uh, thank you much for your time. Uh, um, Jim, sorry to interrupt. I have, a, I have a question that's not about the process, but about like the district or the requirements in general. Is that? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's totally, it's totally fair game. That, since it, you're, since you're here and you might not be back at one of these, is the intent, that's a fun shape. <laughs> is the intent that we can draw it sort of however best suits our ability to meet the requirements. So, you know, we want to draw the shape that best captures the existing dense multifamily areas and the within half a mile to try as best we can to already have met 15 units per acre or space where that could happen. But like we can make this a squiggly, squiggly as we like it to to get there yeah so uh so a couple of different things that I, I think i'm hearing you ask ask that i'll try to be uh clarify so the regulations are very specific as it relates to the zoning that gets put in place has to allow a minimum density of the 15 units per acre but also based on some serious other map uh high level we have to have 114 acres minimum within our district it can be drawn as squiggly as it wants to be. Um, there are some exceptions and carve outs for things that are not developable land, wetlands, for example, some other types of, of things. So there's a couple, there's a little bit of nuance there. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of, you know, if we as a community wanted to draw uh, or, you know, include, for example, like grace and loss, that acreage would go towards the density, but there wouldn't be, because there's some an existing building there that wouldn't allow you to like, Rob Peter to pay Paul to have less of a of a size zoning district, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So it has to be that capacity, and it's agnostic as to what's there currently. It just has to have a total capacity of this is the amount of land, this is the minimum density. Therefore, it, that's the the mm -hmm. number of units that theoretically could get built if it was all built at exactly fifteen units per acre. Got it. And does it have to be one district since we have two? commuter rail stations, could we end up having two districts that are not connected or do, would we need to like have a, great, a district that's sort of barbell shaped with a, a big nope. area at each end? Nope, so that, that's a great question. And and so the regulations explicitly to, um, have a guidance as it relates to that. So you can have multiple districts as long as they're both within uh, half a mile of the, the T station and there's minimum thresholds in terms of how much has to be within that half mile radius. However, if you have two of them, then you just have to have a minimum of 25 contiguous acres for each individual one. So you could have Got like it. 125 for 125. The other thing is, to your point, we have we have some flexibility in terms of where we cite this, you know, within that half mile and then percentage that can go come outside of the half mile. It can be as squiggly as it wants to be. We also, you know, taking a step back, if we were interested as a community, we do have the ability to do more than what is required by the state. You know, we're we're minimum of 114 acres. If we wanted to draw this 214, which for the record was the basis of this was on the old guidelines that actually required us to have a larger area. They yeah. they changed it after some pushback from Wakefield and other municipalities. But you know, if we wanted to draw something bigger, we we are fully within our rights to do so. 
Great, thank you. Really appreciate the, the information. Absolutely, okay. I'm more than happy to answer any other questions in terms of you know how the, all the, the the mechanisms here work as well. Sounds like we have someone who's interested, Tiana. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> And I think too, just to note, um, and they've been pressing on this a lot more in the more of the webinars I've been sitting on, is it's really not, this is, this initiative is, or law, <laughs> is really trying to address that middle of the road housing. Um, so anything over, um, you know, around that four to eight unit type thing, I think people automatically go to the larger multifamily. Oh, great, you have it. Yeah. So kind of that middle missing, uh, I'm sorry, missing middle housing. Um, so I just wanted to make note of that too, because I feel like that sometimes is a missing piece and people jump to all the way to the right there on the on the PowerPoint. Um, so, um, and also too, um, mixed use is not part of this. Um, it's just multifamily. Um, so, you know, there has been talks, um, not, not within Wakefield yet, but um, bonuses for potentially having mixed use as part of your development, if it is one of those larger, like a tono, for example, um, and things like that. So those are the type of conversations the, the working group would be having um, as we kind of get creative in what that might look like. Um, yeah, and, and if, if, and Aaron, you know, if I, if I, for a second, um, you know, it, I think this kind of missing middle that's being defined, if people are interested, you know, for example, we went and tried to find there's a building that was actually recently completed on Chestnut Street in town that this is, you know, a little bit more dense than what's required by it, but it's 18.2 acres or units per acre. But this is the type of building that's close to the minimum threshold. Um, if you guys are interested, we also have other precedents of what 15 units an acre ish looks like um, that have been provided by the state. But that's that's kind of what we're talking about in terms of what's allowed, quote, by right. Uh, Jim, if I could ask a question uh, a minute ago, I think I heard you heard you saying that there used to be a minimum that was larger, and that there was some pushback from some towns, including Wakefield, to and that, then it was revised to be smaller. Can you explain a little what the what the pushback was, in particular from Wakefield, and sort of where that came from? Yeah, so so specific to the the feedback from Wakefield. We were pushing back because the way that the state was previously classifying the level of service associated with the MBTA was if you were a uh, uh, rapid transit, so like red line, green line, orange line uh, community, you were a commuter rail community or you were a bus community. And each of those had different thresholds in terms of how much, um, what a multiplier you'd have to do. And so I think. Uh, and if I recall, I think the bus communities had more um, requirements in terms of the housing they had to provide as a minimum vis-a-vis -vis the commuter rail communities. And there was a lot of pushback in town that how can you call us a bus community when we have one bus that runs on somewhat infrequent service? Honestly, what ended up happening is the state said, this is a mess. They made it so now it, it simplified it. So there's, there's no distinction between a commuter rail and a bus community, it's just commuter rail community. And so that was the nature of the pushback from Wakefield. As you may imagine, if you go to other municipalities, there's been a lot more pushback in terms of, you know, that this is even a thing. Um, and Aaron probably can speak more to it. You know, you've been in a lot of those meetings with other municipalities as it relates to the nature of their pushback as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think the pushback too. yeah, I won't speak to more what Jim was talking about. That was a big pushback. And I know for Wakefield, like he said, it was, you know, well, we have the two commuter rails here. Why are we, you know, falling within that category? Um, and so the other aspects of pushback that a lot of communities have been given to is one, the mixed use is a big thing too, because people don't want to eliminate, you know, if they do put their um, multifamily by right in a downtown area, for example, don't want to get rid of their commercial, you know, districts by allowing multifamily by right. So that's been a big thing. A second thing has also been the affordability component. Prior to the new regulations that came out in October, there was no affordability component. And as many of you know, eight, um, Wakefield has already had 18% inclusionary zoning. Um, and so, um, and we've proven that it, it that it has worked for many projects that we've had. 
Um, so then you see that 10% now, and there still is some pushback on, pushback on that from many communities saying that we've proven this has worked for us. Um, we're supposed to be addressing you know, the need for more housing for everyone. Um, so that, that got changed and I'm sure that's gonna evolve as well. Um, and that was something that we kind of alluded to as well. But um, there's always something that someone else kind of thinks of on these calls that they haven't thought about. Um, you know, it's just a lot to digest. And so um, I think it's gonna be evolving and it'll be nice to have Ezra as a consultant um, kind of keeping us on the path of anything new that might come come through and um, things to be thinking about. But those were kind of the big things um, in regards to one, what we were um, being designated as and, and to those other two components. Okay, well, thanks for coming and join us and talking about this. Thank yeah. you for having us. Yeah, absolutely. For thanking, thank you for having us. And again, if uh, any members of the public are watching uh, the planning board, we have another meeting regarding this where public the public can provide public comment on uh, and or learn more uh, January 24th and February 28th. And again, thank you guys so much for having us and for uh, for listening to the develop this process that is unfolding. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Have Bye. a great night. Thank you. All righty. Um, next is updates from subcommittees. Um, so the waste reduction subcommittee uh, has been a lot of action the last month. We um, started the composting and food rescue program at the Walton Elementary School. Um, so that has been going on for, uh, that started right after the new year. It's, so this will be the second week um, and it's been going really well. Uh, we're donating the food to the Boys and Girls Club and um, the kids have learned really fast, um, you know, kind of how to separate their their lunch items into the different bins. Um, so uh, yeah, we're uh, it's been going well so far. We're starting uh, the same programs at Greenwood next week. So um, been a lot of uh, good stuff going on there in the schools, um, and. Uh, Tiana, you want to add anything? We shipped off a box of candy wrappers just before New Year's to the group that recycles them. Nice. It was almost full. It was like three quarters of the way full. Yeah, we'll have to get on the ball earlier next year. Um and uh oh, and we're working on a, a proposed bylaw potentially which we'll bring here maybe as soon as next meeting um about uh requiring that multifamily new or re uh, significantly renovated multifamilies uh need to provide recycling services um Anne is uh, helping chase down maybe some examples of if anyone else does has such a requirement. We're going to try to uh, crib from another uh, town nearby, uh, but then we're looking to we're looking to write something up that we can bring to the uh, I guess the May town meeting for um, making sure that multifamilies have to recycle, starting with new ones. So if anyone has ideas or feedback um, or knows of towns nearby that do that, uh, please send, uh, send ideas my way. Awesome. Um, yeah, I guess the only other thing was the recycling event that um, we're planning at the library for February. With I'll talk, ask, talk about the community oh, okay. education. It's a, it's a collab. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cross subcommittee collab. Um, so yeah, we could talk. About I can talk. I can tell. I can tell about it now. I will right. skip it when we get to the other one. Um, so uh, Gretchen Carey, who came to this meeting 
three, three, three months ago, maybe, um, from Republic Services uh, is going to do a presentation uh, for the town at the library on February 1st, which is coming up in just a few short weeks, um, uh, Wednesday, February 1st at 7 p.m. Um, all about recycling is going to be, you know, an even better version of what she told us uh, at our meeting. Uh, give lots of tips what should and should not get recycled. Why does it even matter? Uh, you know, is it worth it? What, you know, what is really happening to those particular items? Um, answer questions. Um, so it's going to be at the library in the lecture room. Uh, WCAT is going to record it so that we have it available as a video that we can share or post on our website for folks to enjoy after the fact if they can't make it. Um, yeah, so I would love help spreading the word. We've posted about it. Uh, posters will be going up in the poster kiosks. Um, I would love help uh, getting it, getting word out to the high school. Maybe the recycling club can help promote that. Um, I'll send around all the details uh, to this whole group um, after the meeting. Uh, but yeah, any any avenues you have for spreading the word, please spread it. Uh, we want to have a a good group there to learn all about the joys of recycling. Did you send it to Jen McDonald? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, and she's putting it on all of the places she can put things. Great, and I assume the library is going to be. Yes, yeah, they're. I just sent them the details uh, yesterday. They're going to help promote. Awesome. Yeah, the library is excited about it. The library is a big fan of recycling, apparently. <laughs> cool. Uh, that's all the updates from us. Uh, next, land protection. All right. Um, I had actually um, thought that land protection might turn this meeting into a three hour plus meeting. Um, uh, that's not the case, and so I did some quick looking when I got on here, and there wasn't public participation to find out why. So uh, the the reason I thought so is that um, there's been a lot of concern about the proposal for the new uh, VOC, the new vocational school. Um, some of you have heard quite a bit about that, um, and, and Julie, please chime in here in terms of your perspectives on this. There's there, there's a very vocal and concerned uh, set of Wakefield residents who are just worried about both the current plan, which involves building the new Vogue up on the hill and everything else. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, habitat disruption, uh, removal of forest cover, um, blasting that'll be involved in that. Um, and they're also equally upset, if not more so, with the process and, the, and their feelings that they've been cut out of opportunities to provide that input uh, in different parts. And it is complicated, uh, and Julie has a better perspective on this, but the fact that a lot of this decision-making takes place outside of Wakefield Town Committees in terms of putting some of this together, but also how that's interacted. So they focused on wanting the ESC to take a stand. Um, and um, because they felt frustrated and cut out of other parts of the process, and there's uh, there was quite a bit of, um, not a ton of people, but very lengthy public participation at the Land Use Subcommittee. Um, so I'll, I'll say a bit more about what I think we should do next with that, but I realize that the reason we don't have that public participation today is that the VOC school board's meeting is today and started at seven o'clock. So I think that this group of concerned citizens has decided to target public participation at that meeting instead of ours. Otherwise, we would have been in for a very different meeting today. Uh, Julie, before I talk about what we might, what what I think we should do to respond to these concerns, do you want to give some more on the process? Because I know you have a better big picture. Um, I mean, I I think you you touched upon it. Uh, what happened essentially is a lot of the meetings were happening during COVID. Um, as Sean said, they were outside of Wakefield. Not all they did not have the same standards around Zoom that Wakefield insisted upon, and so I, I think there was legitimately. Um, Nothing was done wrong, but it was just not kind of as open as I think Wakefield residents have come to expect. And there was actually a snafu at town meeting where when we passed it as a town at town meeting, the, the Vokes um, presentation for some reason did not load. And so there is a fair um, complaint that people voted on the Voke without seeing the actual location of where it was going to be placed. Um, so, so I, I, I do, I definitely empathize um, 
with with their concerns um, from a process standpoint. And quite frankly, all things being equal, I agree with them that, you know, building it on um, on the piece of land that they're going to build it is definitely going to have some some impacts about things that I think this committee cares a lot about. Um, I'm personally, and I'll only speak for myself personally, I mean, I'm personally torn. There's a lot of money caught up in this. MSBA um, has, um, has, has committed a lot of money to this. There's actually some additional legislative money, and we really need a new vocational school. And I actually think that the, the people we heard from are not against a new vocational school, and by no means do I um, want to imply that they are against it. So so it's it's a very, very difficult um, situation. When the vote came in front of the town council recently, um, we all asked them what was the process and whether there was any way to change the location and their response is that um, it's already been approved and that actually the lower site, I think what they refer to as C2, is not um, actually a viable site um, because there is really no means of egress. There's no way to put another access road um, up to the vote from that side. So um I, I there's probably some uh different are opinions about, on that uh, are you talking about the um idea of, of putting it on the playing field yes yeah, so the idea of putting it on the playing field when we asked specifically about putting it on the playing field um they said that there's i guess there's two considerations one is that you couldn't construct it and keep people in the existing school as well so where the way it's being constructed now is you can keep everybody in the existing school build up on the hill move everybody up um take that down and make that whatever they're going to do with it. I don't know whether they're going to move fields around or I imagine plant some things. Um, the other concern was that I guess um, that abuts to land that they did not own. And so I think there is a real consensus that we need another access road up into the vocational school. And so I think it would have probably had to go down through Water Street and there just wasn't the land ownership to put an access road through Water Street and not down through Farm. Now, I admit I have not looked at this. Um, and, and certainly the people we heard from the other night um, said that some of the sustainability or some of the assessments that had been done actually said that it was a viable site. So I think there's a lot of, it's, it's been a difficult information process. Um, and again, I, I definitely empathize with them. I think all things being equal, we would all love to save every single tree. Um, I did speak today with some people in the town who don't think that it's a, a process that can be reversed. Um, but that doesn't mean that this committee couldn't say, you know, we we encourage, you know, we don't like to see this land being taken and we want the vote built, um, you know, and we encourage you to, to take another look. Um, but I certainly don't want to derail the vote either. So it's a very difficult situation. And Sean handled it wonderfully. And and we we heard a lot. And And, and I was really glad that you know, that they came to us and shared their thoughts. I thought it was very insightful. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you know, the key concerns that were brought to us um, included, as we mentioned, the site blasting, the general land use issues. Um, uh, also, uh, one of the speakers talked quite a bit about drainage issues on the site and implications that that might have for neighboring properties. Um, uh, and also was concerned about some of the way that opposition to the Hill site had been characterized by some of the VOC officials in the Boston Globe, or sorry, uh, I don't think it was the Globe, I think. I think it, it was the Globe. Oh, was it the Globe? Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, that it wasn't just nimbyism and people not wanting kids, uh, you know, uh, uh, walking through trails uh, to school on the side of their lands or things like that. Um, uh, the I, I think it's absolutely correct what Julie said that you know that the opposition to this site they very they very deliberately have stated that they're in support of the Vogue. Um, at least the the Facebook postings is uh, there's an account now called uh, Build the Vogue Save the Trees, and that's been the main place for kind of sharing some of these concerns on social media. Um, but they have asked, and the specific request of us that came at the land use subcommittee was that the ESC take a vote. To make a position statement that that would be a way of um kind of trying to get this back on the books at some of the other committees uh in town that do have a regulatory function they understand that we don't have a regulatory or oversight function 
Um, so my specific suggestion on this, um, there were some materials that were shared by some of the public participants that I asked them to forward to the e to the town email account. And Melissa, if we could forward those to the ESC members and put on next month's agenda to have a vote on a statement similar in maybe similar in length, um, but uh, more uh, concerned than supportive uh, to the vote we had on the high school thing, but just that, you know, that's, you know, that these have been raised, that it seems that these, uh, that there are some legitimate environmental concerns that have been raised, and that this um, should be, if possible, revisited by the appropriate uh, regulatory and approval committees within the town, as well as uh, given proper voice uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, I don't think we can do much. We don't have direct oversight on that. So, you know, I think a statement is really all we could do, and but it's also what we were asked to do. Um, so, Melissa, if that sounds good to you, and if you can circulate that out from the ESC email address, and if people could use that as a little bit of homework so that we can have a more broadly informed conversation on that and uh, see if we feel comfortable um, you know, voting on and we'll, I imagine we'll vote on whether we approve or not a, a statement um, uh, of concern. Uh, Are we'll, you we'll see next putting month. that statement together? I can put together a first draft of that. Yeah. Um, so, um, and again, um, I wasn't sure exactly how much input I can get from folks on something pre-vote before it's deliberation uh, outside of a meeting. So if we, you know, I don't know if people had thoughts or suggestions, but I think the input from all of you will be better and it's more fair to all of you to give you a chance to look at some of the materials that were shared with us so that you can, um, you know, uh, we, we can have a more informed vote. And um, and to look at the materials at the Vogue, you know, they, they yeah. have a similar website to what's happening with the high school that we should all look at as well. Um, and I will say on the, um, the, the Conservation Commission is looking at this, certainly mm -hmm. we, they're the regulatory body specifically on giving permits. Um, and they actually are the subject matter experts, particularly on the on the runoff type things. I don't pretend to know anything about that. So, um, and and I will just I will also say that I think even even a simple statement like this, um, I, I'm not sure there's anything that anybody at the local level, other than conservation commission, who's looking at the permits, can do. But you know, if it does become a state level, there's there's what nine towns involved with this. If it does go up to the state level, that may be where a statement from us holds a little more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, has some impact. I I don't think it's unrealistic. I again, I don't know anything. I'm not saying like, I, I would not be surprised if some of the folks who've chatted with us are also looking at what legal avenues might be there. The fact that they've raised process concerns would mean that there might be stand again, not saying that as a any sort of expert opinion. Um, and also, I don't think it's speaking out of school to say that. Um, uh, Judy Green, who's part of our land use subcommittee and is, you know, the uh, you know, as town staff representative on the conservation commission, definitely has sympathy for for the you know, she's not defensive about this or you know, so so I think this is likely to keep growing. I don't think it's going away. And I, I thought this the ask for us to take a look and, and um see if we can make a statement is reasonable given the importance of this. Yeah, I think that um, we have to be very, very careful here. First of all, nobody wants to lose trees and stuff like that. But uh, like any other huge um, uh, construction program and so forth and so on, there are trade-offs, okay? And the people that have, have done the planning and, and have taken a look at all of the options and so forth and so on, and I'm sure they're aware that, that yeah, we're going to have to take down some trees, we're going to have to do some blasting and so forth and so on. and and but as far as the ESC is concerned, yes, we are concerned about it. But we also have to say that um, we kind of put some trust behind the people who have done the planning and say, we've looked at all of this and this is the best possible thing that can happen. Yeah. Well, you make, you make an interesting point, Dan. I mean, maybe we certainly heard from one side, maybe at our next meeting, we invite the vote to really kind of mm -hmm. talk us through what their process was. The, have they have they done that anywhere? Um, they did it a bit at town meeting, town council rather, but um, we could really have them just focus on on this issue. Like I, I, I do feel like this issue gets muddled a lot with ADA issues and, 
you know, there's 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 a lot of concerns about this vote that really do not fall within the jurisdiction of this group or the interests of, of our group. But um, you know, it, it might be interesting to to just talk about this mm -hmm. and and to to understand, you know, why why wasn't it put at the other other area? We're not gonna. I mean, truthfully, we're not gonna undo anything. I don't believe at this point. So, um, but it'd be interesting to hear both sides of the story. Uh, given that. I, I rather agree that we're maybe unlikely at this stage to undo. Is there a place for asking for like something beneficial to come of it? Like this isn't a great site. We're disappointed. Are there going to be classes taught at the VOC that address sustainability in some way that would talk about land use that would think, you know, for, for folks who are going to be in uh you know, construction or relevant trades that they learn, like use this as a case study about siting a building or like, is there a way to, you know, if we can't fix it, ask at least for some, you know, something good to come out the other side from a sustainability standpoint. I know the building is already gonna be wildly more sustainable than the past one and the energy park and all of that, but like, is, is there is there a way to, to use this as an opportunity to get something else beneficial that they can change at this stage of the game. It's a great idea. So it's a great idea. Just for context on this, the Save the Forest, Build the Voke group does have a petition on change.org. Um, I don't know how many of the people who signed that position would have standing or how many are outside the vote communities, but there's over 4,000 signatures on that petition. So, you know, um, it, it's not three neighbors who are being good about raising voices, right? Um, and just some of the, um, I, I, Dan, I hear what you're saying, but also just some of the input we've had um, uh, from folks who have been following this a little bit, like, you know, that <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure where the facts are in terms of um, uh, uh, what's, you know, that all things are considered or, or, or you know, there, so at least the opponents of the ble uh, the hilltop site are saying that they're, are claiming there's another viable site, even though, you know, the, the hows and whys of that, there, there's arguments on both sides. So again, I think we should take a look at that, be prepared for a vote, maybe invite people from both sides uh, to speak on that. Again, I think the, um, I think we would have had quite a bit of public participation on this issue if it weren't for that meeting conflict. I'm sure that this discussion, um, uh, the recording of this will be watched closely by uh, folks um, who came to uh, some of the subcommittee. And I, and I know that we've kind of other subcommittee meetings uh, in the last few weeks as well. So um, I personally I feel that we should at least be responsive and deliberative, even if, even if we don't agree, then we can have that vote. Has Sean. that group talked to other towns that are part of the VOC uh, communities? Do you know? I'm pretty sure they're active in all the communities. You mean the the the, the same people who are talking that came to yeah. our committee meeting? Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure they're active in all the communities. Yeah, I just think that like, you know, obviously Wakefield residents have a kind of bigger, you know, stake in the game, but, um, you know, it's not just for, the school's not just for Wakefield students. And mm. if there was other towns that kind of, you know, stood up as well to the, the woke people, it may have a bigger impact. I'm just curious if they have been working with other towns at all. Well, you know, so this all affects Breakout and most of Breakout is in Lynn. Um, there's just a little bit in Saugus and a little bit in, um, in Wakefield. And and so if you're going to look at any town, look at Lynn and find out what's coming from there. But Lynn is not part of the Vogue community, right? Oh, I don't know. That may be. Yeah. Yeah, they have their own technical high school. Yeah. Sean, um, it was during COVID, but kind of late COVID. I attended one of the vocational school. Well, I think it's the last public meeting they've hosted for the school committee. and. So it was pre, I think, the formation of Save the Forest, um, Save the School. But they, they had legal representation. Um, at that, that moment, their questions were related to state processes and if they had had um, the proper reviews. 
um, based on, I think, the Endangered Species Act. Have they, and I, I, I know that's sort of resolved, but they had legal representation there. Have they pursued any legal stuff as far as you know? I really don't know. They didn't um, mention it? It hasn't been mentioned to us. No, they were really focusing on those environmental impacts within Wakefield, which, I mean, is appropriate in terms of when they're chatting with us as the Wakefield Environmental Sustainability Committee. So, okay. you know, they weren't talking, they didn't talk, they kept a focus and they weren't talking about their broader strategy. Um, okay. I, I will say that, um, you know, when when we found out that the vote was going to be, Tom, chime in, when we found out that the vote was going to be run with natural gas, we mobilized, uh, you know, not just us, but a lot of the towns. And they did come to the table and work with us on switching to electric, which is where the whole energy part came in. And so um, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely sensitive to the tree issue, but I also really feel like the Volk has been very responsive um, to dealing with its kind of climate footprint issues, which is not insignificant. Um, so I, I just want to be clear that we definitely applaud them for doing that. Um, and and I, I have a bit of a fear that some of the same people, you know, who are who are making a lot of noise on this are also not so in favor of the energy park. And if that energy park fails, the impact from a climate standpoint is going to be devastating. So I just want to balance those interests. Agreed. Somehow. And I know that was going to be a question, Sean. Was there any, in your subcommittee, were there any comments um, or feedback around the energy part, or is it strictly just the, the, the VOC? It, it's really just the VOC, the focus on ca canopy loss, um, drainage, um, potential, you know, some habitat disruption. Uh, from the canopy loss, and then um, uh, the ADA uh, issue that uh, Julie mentioned ties in because they're saying that you know there's meant to be a lot of steps and whatever, so they're also saying this is not as inaccessible of a um, uh, of a spot. So you know, uh, and there was actually a fair amount of discussion of that in the public participation, but again, that that's not as directly relevant to our purview here. So. Um, yeah, I um, again, I, I I still don't feel particularly well informed on this issue. It's just that they they've uh, uh, the folks have uh, chosen to um, use public participation opportunities to um, uh, circle around to this. And I definitely think if we're putting this on the vote for next week, we'd also want to invite Judy Green to be at this meeting next month. Excuse me, not next week, um, uh, because I, if she's willing to share some of her perspectives, I think people find that useful. Yeah, and, and how do people feel about inviting somebody from the vocational school to talk about kind of the, the process and some, and I do know they have some activities to Tiana's point um, that they are planning on integrating into um, like the curriculum. Just so we, so just so we have a balanced input. That's great. Right, I think a statement could say we support the vote. We support the sustainability efforts that they are making, for instance, being all electric, et cetera, what similar to the one we just voted for the high school. However, we don't support the location and, you know, would like there to be looked at again. But I think balancing it to say that we support the good things that, that are happening. Uh, well, I don't, I don't, again, I think we have to be very, very careful about this. I don't think that we should say support or not support the, with the, the position, you know, where it goes, because then what we're saying is that, you know, whatever, whatever the people who planned this thing did, we don't support it. And so that could be also from a legal standpoint of view, say we don't support where it is. We, maybe we can make a general statement, like, you know, we, <clears throat> always, and I'm thinking off the top of my head, you know, when, when looking at big projects, we like to balance, I mean, maybe it's very general, not even specific to the vote. You know, we want to balance conservation and climate and all these other things. And we encourage all projects to do that. <laughs> I don't know. Dan, why do you think that there's a legal risk for us to saying if we, if we were to not support it, that we don't support it? We're not claiming to be regulatory and therefore being able to say or so I, I guess I'm trying to understand what you're. Yeah. Concerned. So again, that that is based upon um, people saying that there was legal representation for this group, um, and like you know, in any re legal process, 
um, whether you, you know, it, they, they bring in all kinds of things that, that support their position. And this is just one thing. And I don't think we can say that we don't support what they did. I mean, it, it's not in our pur purview, but we just should say the things that we are, we are in, uh, that we are involved in and that, and that we, we show because again, right in our mission statement, I think it says that um, you know uh, that the things that we do are attainable, and you know that we don't support. You know that says that we don't we don't really um, want the vote there, and I don't think that's up to us. case, I think, you know, send the email around and let everybody put in their comments and let's, let's talk about that, you know, give people time to think about it and, and what, what it really means, what we're trying, really trying to do, uh, you know, as a, as a committee, um, and then go from there next in the next meeting. All right, thank you all. Um, so uh, let me just get out of uh, our subcommittee report as quickly as possible in terms of non vote issues. Um, just, I think the main two things we um, discussed uh, other than that, um, the open space recreation planning process that's moving ahead. There haven't been, I, I'm the ESC representative on that. There haven't been any more meetings since the last time we had one of our meetings. Um, the process right now is that in, um, uh, there's a survey that's going out. Um, uh, sorry, I had that email and I, I had my, I have all my notes on this in emails and I, move that to bring up the other part of this. Um, so uh, there's a public meeting on February 1st, excuse me, um, a survey that opens up in February and runs through March. And then the next, uh, the OSRP workshop, uh, and I believe that's the next meeting with the full committee at it, is, get, is meant to be scheduled for early March, but hasn't been scheduled yet. Um, John, so more on- did you say the first? Is February that the 1st for the fourth and final public meeting. Is on, that the same day as recycling? Is that what Tatiana said? Yep. Okay. The recycling talk at the library. Library. Yeah. yeah. That's, at that's the same awesome. time or different times on the, the same day? I'm sure they're both evening. Okay. <laughs> I don't have times in my email on that. And um, uh, so is yeah. that the is that the master plan? N no, this is the open space recreation. Because that's also February first. It turns out, and email <laughs> went out about that today. Okay. So. Um, oh Lord. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so if we go to the front, let's see. Um, hold on one moment. Sorry. Um, interesting. Yeah, so um, upcoming meetings, all upcoming events. Um, February 1st, the town calendar. Well, according to the town calendar, there's nothing happening on February 1st. So um, no, we're, we're just imagining all that. Um, so I don't know why it's not showing. Uh, the only event showing in February is the land use subcommittee meeting for our Yeah, because you need to send in the agenda and then it gets broken. And, and it yeah. doesn't, yeah, so. Well, did you look at the community side of the field? Because there's a community in So yes, the master plan public workshop is February 1st. Okay. The open space recreation plan, I was told is February 1st. That's what I have in the email. And I don't believe that they're, that it's a joint. I thought it was a separate meeting, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, and we have an event that we're hosting February 1st. So um, the, the other thing I did want to mention about the open space recreation uh, plan, the last plan from 2005 to 2010, so it's being developed in uh, late 2004 and 2005, has a really amazing um, inventory of town re natural resources, town historical sites, and other things. A lot of great stuff. Um, probably the best one-stop shopping for that that I've come across. So I'm still digesting it. Um, I know that Tiana already, Tiana, did you already forward out some of that or no? So we talked uh, about- Not yet, but we, we talked about publicizing that to the broader community, but I would encourage anyone, I assume anyone who's on this group and the things that interest you that brought you to this group, you would find this document interesting. And I assume that the current consultants would be doing an updating of that as part of the process here. So I, I didn't know that existed. So I thought that was great. Um, last thing I'll mention, uh, just a fast informational point, the Conservation Commission is, uh, as I mentioned last time, is setting up this um, 
uh, kind of recreational land stewards, conservation corps, they want to call it, as a way of incorporating volunteers to help um, maintain trails and other things like that. So um, the idea had kind of come up in some of the conversation we we had been having, but um, uh, Judy had seen the Conservation Commission as a better home for uh, being able to support that because then the, she has staff, a uh, town staff can support that. And so our role um, is to help recruit volunteers once they've got all the I's dotted and T's crossed on that. So uh, it sounded like that might be happening in the next few weeks. So hopefully in the next few weeks we can start publicizing that and anyone who wants um, to feel good about yourself by helping keep trails maintained and, and recreational lands clean and all that uh, might be something to consider signing up for. Uh, but also I think it'd be a great set of volunteer opportunities for people in town. Um, that's all I have. I think that's enough. Longest land use subcommittee report I've ever given. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. All right. Next is building efficiency. Well, I think we've talked about both the projects tonight. Um, this right now, from the, the Wakefield Memorial High School standpoint, um, the designers are not likely doing much that they don't want to spend time while they wait for a town to make sure they're going to fund the project. So um, I know they, they do regularly meet with the permanent building committee still, but um, right now they just need to get to the vote um, so then they could proceed and have, you know, other meetings and engagements. So. And what the VOC is doing, I assume they're having their designers go off. I, you know, I haven't seen any published schedules or anything like that, so I don't have info. All right. Uh, volunteer coordination, Dan. You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Dan. Okay, here I am. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I, uh, yesterday I sent out the, uh, or the day before, I can't remember which, um, the emails to uh, the prospective volunteers that have signed up over the, over the period of time. Um, there were um, some 18 odd um, uh, signups, 20. Um, I also have uh, the previous, um uh student liaisons that i'm going to be sending something out to because the letter is a little bit different um as well as the um applicants for esc positions that uh, didn't uh didn't make it um again another letter um that i have to uh, just kind of modify before i send it out we've had some responses um one says yep thanks uh, we will take a look at that um another one uh you know she said she was from saugus and um, that she's just interested in what's going on in Wakefield and stuff like that. And I kind of mentioned that, you know, you don't have to be a Wakefield resident and you can do most of the volunteering, um, you know, remotely and all of that type of stuff. So, um, you know, we'll just see what happens over the next couple of weeks. Uh, people sometimes are slow to respond or slow to re read their emails or don't get around to doing anything about it. So we'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, I would say for the student liaisons, a lot of them graduated and they moved out of Wakefield, so um, you may not want to send anything to them. Well, again, uh, Melissa, this is what I'm saying, you know, p even people that aren't in Wakefield, um, why would they be interested in, in doing this? But she showed interest um, and the students were, uh, you know, intimately involved with the ESC and in, in, in their school. And if they want to become a volunteer, they can do this remotely. So okay. that's that's why I'm including them. All right. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, next is greenhouse gas inventory, Chris. Yeah, so not a lot new since last time. Um, I don't know, Melissa, you may have uh, given a bit of an update, but we're we've gotten pretty much uh, all the numbers plugged into the tool. Uh, a few things we're looking to refine and um, maybe gather some additional information to kind of get better estimates for certain metrics that this particular tool um, uses to, to create the emissions inventory. And I think our other next steps um, that we're going to be working on in the next meeting um, and between now and then 
is sort of documentation of the methodology used. And um, also we talked about doing a little bit of sort of peer comparison or benchmarking um, in some way. So we'll be working on that. And I would say possibly by next meeting might have um, sort of like a first draft uh, inventory, you know, total emissions uh, amount to to share with the team here. And uh, and we we're also thinking about like other, you know, going through the process itself, uh, other recommendations that might come out of it, just in terms of what we could do to improve the methodology of uh, keeping that inventory and tracking, as well as other initiatives that might, you know, might help in terms of uh, carbon emissions uh, mitigation. So, um, and uh, Melissa and I were going to schedule the next meeting for later this month. So, anything else? Uh, yeah, I was just going to reach out to, as you said, like um, kind of talking to towns that have done the inventory, like Melrose, and um, kind of see what their like next steps were, and um, you know how they uh, use the inventory. All right, thank you. Are you are are you gonna tell us like are there any big ahas from it? Did you have any idea that this particular you know what I I just love to hear what we learned other than you know our baseline is blah we'd like to change it but just can we is there anything interesting that we can glean from it or can, uh, yeah yeah that's a good, good question Tia I think um I think we should do a little bit of like a report out or sort of like you know what we learned just from going through the process and and sort of like commentary on um the methodology that's used and other things we might want to do um the only one that kind of jumps out to me right now melissa you may have other thoughts but you know one of the things was solid waste and when we for the information that we did get and the, when we put it in and sort of looked at where that came out um for me personally it was not as much of an emissions source specifically as far as greenhouse gas emissions and co2 equivalent as one might think um, but you know, that was just one thing that stuck out to me, but I think there's a bunch of things that we'll be able to kind of learn from the process. And, um, I think the subcommittee can kind of share and report out to the, to the whole committee here. Yeah. I mean, I think our emissions breakdown is very similar to the statewide breakdown of emissions where transportation and buildings are the biggest pieces of the pie. Um, so it's, um, I wasn't really surprised with the results, um, but it, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be pretty similar for, for most of the towns in, in Massachusetts that are, you know, similar to- Well, I was just curious, I mean, most, uh, going out on a limb, most towns don't have a cement factory in their town. Like, I'm curious, is that even, like, is that, a drop in the bucket or is that actually meaningful? I, I hear so often how bad cement is from a greenhouse gas standpoint. We didn't take that into account. You just yeah. put the municipal, right? Well, I'm I'm not sure that uh you know the the this this the the actual cement is made in Wakefield. I think it's delivered to make uh, to Wakefield and then they just mix it with the sand and and the water and deliver it. So, you know, again, I don't, I, it's not that they actually manufacture the, the, you know, from the gypsum and stuff like that, the cement, which is a highly energy intensive and polluting um, thing. And I think that's done in either Canada or other places in the United States. But it, that's a good, I mean, it's a good question. And it, one of the things it does is highlight sort of some of the I guess I'll say shortcomings of the particular methodology that we're using in this tool, but also maybe just highlights like an opportunity to do something a little more detailed and better adapted to our town. Because like another small example of that was um, one of the categories is the use of um, off-road vehicles and combustion. So that means like landscaping equipment, lawnmowers, whatever else. And Melissa and I were talking about, well, if we have a program in our town to incentivize the use of electric lawn care equipment, that wouldn't show up at all in the way that this particular inventory is done. So we could have 100% adoption of that um, program, and it wouldn't change the way that this inventory is tracking for that. So 
but that itself is interesting information, right? And it's a data point. So I think um, it's good that we're going through this. And part of what we hope to bring out of this are like those kinds of um, observations. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to green communities. Well, for the first time, I can say we finally got green communities. Yeah, I, I feel like I've been working on this for like I have been working on this for six years, um, and not just me. There's been a lot, a lot of people who've worked on it. So we found out. I kind of got verbal confirmation that we got it right before the holidays, um, which is great. And we got about a hundred. Look, it comes with a grant of $189,000 and about $189,000. So we, um, Melissa, you're gonna have to remind me, do I actually, is there actually a committee? I know we've just been waiting to get the feedback. Do, do I you're know the, the committee members? Am I the committee? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna recruit some people, especially Jen Calais, of course, who did a, a really yeoman's work on this. Um, we and and the town and I know what she's been wanting to do is also work with the capital planning committee to make sure that we can invest. So basically, we have 90 days to come up with a um, proposal for how to spend this money and to send that to the state to get it. Um, and it's a pretty comprehensive list. We can look at energy efficiency, vehicle purchase. Um, there's a lot of things, and I know that we have priorities we want to link the spending of this money to our priority to reduce our energy consumption. So we'll be looking at all of those um, and coming up with just a system. I'm sure, Anne, you're going to be part of this kind of at the DPW also figuring out how we're going to staff this and track it as well. So, but I think we should just take a moment and celebrate that finally, 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 we feel it is a green community and I'm super proud. Julie, is one of the categories that that money can be spent on, and I'm just thinking for um, for a, a grant writer to continue to write grants um, <laughs> for for green communities, right? Um, um, you know, finding opportunities to you know around energy and you know efficiency, you know greenhouse gas reduction, you know all of the things that fall under the green communities. So it, you can use up to 20% of the grant award, not to exceed 50,000, to provide seed funding for a long-term energy manager position. Okay. Which I, I think would be, be that part would of be, yeah. Scope of. And, and I'm gonna actually advocate, this is a tough year just because of inflation and everything. It's, uh, we're dealing with the budget right now. And I really am beginning to push hard, not just me, but a lot of people are beginning to push hard on a sustainability position in town, um, not just because of this, but municipal vulnerability that we talked about last meeting. There's a lot of things where I think that it could behoove us. So I don't know whether we're going to be able to fund a position for this um, right now, but yes, there is that opportunity. The other thing that I think is interesting and, and it's something that Robin said that really has resonated with me, especially if we get a new high school, um, there is, you can use this money to train building operators, training and cer certification for up to three staff. Um, and one must be a school facility staff on kind of how to operate smarter buildings. Oh. So. Yes. So both of those really, um, there's going to be a big push, I think, from the towns to just spend all this money on capital things. But I really think we want to be thinking about training and, and as you say, Tom, kind of the long-term sustainability and being able to write continued grants. Because the stretch yeah, yeah. code is coming into place. There's so many things. You know, if, if the yeah. new governor puts a climate corridor in place, I, I just think we're going to need some bandwidth. So again, I don't get your hopes up that we're going to get a full-time equivalent of, of a sustainability person in this. We're in a fiscal year, so our fiscal year starts July 1st. But I, I think that we're going to kind of incrementally work our way there, and hopefully in the following fiscal year, we can make a case for it. Yeah, it's just to me, you know, seeding that just feeds the, the ability to um, capture capture more and do more with it, right? Right, right. 
uh, it's, you know, that. And maybe it's a part time, you know, maybe it's somebody that we can bring in part time and then we can, you know, we can scale them up or something. I don't know. I think we're going to have to be creative. But yes, I, I love all these ideas and I really love the building operator. It might be a little early in this round, but hopefully there's future funding that we can do that. Julia, sure, I, so. I don't know. I might be speaking out of turn in terms of the gas and light with the energy park has already been awarded a grant um, for education. Now I know that the grant was, I think part of it is, or it's targeted to education of the students, particularly at the VOC, but you know, including our high school. But I would say that that kind of falls in the bucket of education as, as well. Yep, uh, yep. You know, just we can potentially chat online and see how those things okay. can. I will send both of these documents to the ESC email. Um, Melissa, if you just want to circulate to, or I could just, I could just send it to probably everybody. Yeah. So take so a look Julie, at it. If, yeah. Yeah. So um, the other thing about grant writers, um, I used to be a grant writer, by the way, but um, you can also contract grant writers True. and you can specify in the contract that if you don't get the grant, they don't get paid. Yeah. <laughs> but if they do get the grant, they get some percentage of, of what that, what that money is. Yep. Okay. All good things to think about. Also, um, in green communities, and I don't know if this is a place to bring it up or, or not, you, um, and Robin, thanks for sending that up, that the stretch codes were promulgated on the tw December 23rd, um, which also you know enables the specialized opt-in code. I don't know if, the, if anyone at the state has already drafted like what language needs to be put in a warrant um but i'd like to see us work on that and get that you know whether you know probably starts from the esc and brings it to the town council um to potentially get that in for for the may town meeting um yeah. to to you know adopt the the specialized stretch code because it really is the the state's enablement and key for municipalities to meet the um 2050 net zero goals. Um, that's why the, the opt-in specialized code was was placed in there. So Tom, next Friday, I signed up for a training on the latest, both the updated stretch code as well as the opt-in. So the folks hosting it may even be DEOR, um, Energy Resource. So maybe I'll see if they have um, some start of a language for communities to use it to see if it applies to them. Would you also mind sending me the link to sign and if I have it's sure. Friday tomorrow or Friday no 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 next Friday the twentieth. Um, it's yeah, virtual, I, so yeah, that helps. Samples, I'd love to 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 join that. I will show. I and that. Julie, slightly off topic, but you didn't mention it. The um having a, a person in place for the high school to support the new systems. Mm -hmm. um, I've collected from some trainings and um, clients some advertisements that they use to kind of list the qualifications of what they're looking for. So oh. if you're looking in the opposite to try to have someone rise to that level, it does go into a little bit of what they were looking for. So let me know if you want me to share that. Yeah, I, I definitely think we should, you know, probably have a conversation with the facilities manager um, at the high school sooner rather than later on this. And Ian, um, maybe maybe DPW can help us facilitate that because I know you guys have some oversight for the buildings too. I was going to add that um, when that person is in place and identified during design, that extremely helps the project and be successful afterwards. Waiting till okay. after they hand somebody a building puts them at a disadvantage. So now is the time you're saying? Uh, certainly, getting in the works if it becomes you know either a training to get to that person ready or to mm -hmm. to. Um, get it into the thought on a budget standpoint okay this is kind of the, the moment yeah do we have that kind of position right now that like kind of a journeyman for, for the schools i don't even know uh from at the little level i see the i think the answer is no and part of that's because most don't yet and you know the the need and the gaps are um seen a lot so but um, one of the examples I have is what was used in Saugus. So there's, you know, very close examples of folks who they hired and so forth. Awesome. Well, great news, Julie. Thanks for sharing. Sure. 
Uh, last is community education. Uh, yep. Yeah. So the big thing is the uh, recycling education event, which I mentioned already during waste reduction. Um, otherwise, we've been continuing to post all the great stuff that y'all are doing that y'all send my way, um, all sorts of, you know, ways we had a bunch of different things related to the holidays. Um, and any, I'm trying to post any town related events, uh, meetings, things that are, uh, you know, ways, ways of recycling. We post about the cardboard pop-up, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I appreciate folks continuing to re share and like them on Facebook so that they actually get eyeballs. Um, and uh, Sean's got the email list up and running. Um, it may be that the uh, event on the first, the advertisement of that should be the first uh, email blast that goes out to that list. Um, and we, we discussed that we'll probably do sort of more of a roundup uh, digest style of, of some of the other posts, unless something is particularly timely or uh, like a call for volunteers that will, you know, just more informational things will sort of gather up a, a set of them to send periodically. So Tiana, um, that uh, um, a presentation on uh, uh, February 1st, um, it, it does it make sense to have a form there that people can sign up for volunteering? Of course, yeah. Okay. Great idea, thank you. On that event on February 1st, uh, I figured out what part of the confusion was that raised. So we're only conflicting with one other event. So the email on the OSRC timeline was, in my defense, horribly confusing. They want they they listed the master planning events in one color and their events in another color to show that they were threading their events and timeline through the master planning one. So there are not two meetings we're competing with. It's just it is indeed the master planning public meeting which is on February 1st. So only competing with one event that might appeal to like-minded people. Um, so, uh, so. And I think that one's online. So I, yeah. I'm not, I think it's okay. Yeah, that, that's I not as bad. I, I, yeah, that's, that's less bizarre than what I thought. And again, it was not clear in the email, but I, I it was a mistake on my part. So. We'll give you a pass this time. <laughs> I think that's all I got. Continue to send me stuff that you think should get posted. I'm happy to share, uh, and we'll get them out by email too. All right, thank you. Moving on to ESC member groups. Uh, Williams, you have any updates you want to share with us from the schools? Um, there is not currently much happening at the moment, though. We did deal with the. We're still trying to figure out how to incorporate. Um, more things into Recycling Club and possibly get more members in, but yeah. Okay, and if you could help spread the word on our recycling event, that would be awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll send you the details. Thank you. Uh, so no school committee member, and next. So uh, the, uh, Cardboard container, I think, was a huge success uh, for the holidays. We haven't gotten the last ticket uh, back from the weight, but we were probably at about 2,600 pounds of, uh, of cardboard in the two weeks. So that was great. So um, it was busy all day, all day, all night. It was busy. So that was great. Um, also, uh, Representative uh, Garabinian is going to hold her recycling event again. I believe the date is April 8th was just pick. So I think there's will be a couple of meetings before that. And then that Saturday will be the event. Okay. D does she call this like the second annual? Yes. What is, uh, okay. I think there'll be some changes, some additions, but yes, about the same event. Great. And so we need what, like 17 boxes for a uh... <laughs> Plastics recycling. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to uh, figure out what we want to do there. And that's about all. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Julie. I don't think I have any other town council. We're still waiting on the bike pad plan, which I think should be finished this month. Um, 
I do have to report on my liaison. So I'll be reporting a little bit on what ESC is doing. And Melissa, I don't know what you're thinking, but maybe we should get, you know, maybe we should do kind of a more fulsome report on what we're doing, maybe around Earth Day. I don't know. Okay. So, so let's think about a time where we can get the committee in front and talk about all the good things that are going on. That's all I have. Well, if we have any bylaws that we're looking to mm -hmm. get, that the timing might, we might also want to coordinate that timing. That would actually be good timing. The recycling timing. one, the stretch, co optional stretch code. Yeah. Yeah, that could be really good timing. Let's, let's think about how we strategically do that. Um, cause I think town meeting will probably be, I think the town elections like April 25th. So it's probably the next week and it is election time. So if anybody wants to stand up and run for something and bring environment to other levels, do it. Are you allowed to run if you're like on a committee for oh, yeah. like other, okay. you guys are just cutting your teeth to run for something someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, you could definitely run. I was wondering if there's like conflicts of interest. Uh... No, no, I mean, probably more timing type, type of things, you know, time availability, but. Um... Melissa, there actually is, but it's all doable. Yeah. And that um, ethics class we took, they do talk about if you're in multiple committees. So yeah. there's disclosures and stuff you have to fill out, but it's not prohibited. There's plenty of examples of folks on multiple committees. Yeah. And stuff. All right. And lastly, Tom. You're on mute. I'm on mute. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, um, I would like to ask this committee, um, very similar to the high school statement, to um, draft a statement of support for the energy park. And um, we, we vote on that. Uh, the energy park hopefully is going to um, the state level uh, at the legislative to do declare the office environmental and then the legislators two thirds vote and then the, the governor's desk ultimately for that article 97 land transfer. Um, you know, just around the environmental um, sustainability aspects that the energy park brings. Um, we are still currently in front of the Conservation Commission. Uh, some of the stuff that has come out of there are for the one acre of land on Hemlock. Um, the proposal that as it stands today, uh, we will be providing uh, two and a half acres of forested land behind Farm Street, which is um, classified as ACE, which is Area of Critical Environmental Concern. Uh, some of that land is value, you know, from an environmental land value, those that don't know, that's kind of the highest classification uh, around that. Um, the land that we would be getting on Hemlock is not of that classification. Uh, it is a lower class. Uh, in addition to that, the um, burn substation over on Albion, we would be it's a decommission the substation. We would be remediating that land uh, and returning that land from industrial use to a um, parklet uh, with some tree covering pathways, green space in in that area. And then third, the trees that we would be removing, um, we're going to replant all of those. Uh, and the Conservation Commission uh, asked for us to actually, you know, well, that's great. Um, we're defor deforesting an area. They've asked for canopy return. Uh, we have identified an acre of land that's adjacent and part of the town forest off of Maple Way that uh, apparently 30-ish years ago used to have a house. And it's kind of an open space at this point. So we'd be using those trees to reforest that area. Um, and there would still be leftover tree inventory um, uh, of the replacement 128 trees. And so that's kind of the three parts uh, that's, you know, as our trade for that one acre of land to build the, the energy park. So you're transplanting the trees? No, we're not transplanting. There would be new trees. We'd be reforesting oh, okay. that area. But it's, a you know, the area in, in off of Maple Way uh, would be connecting, um, there's part of the town forest that is disconnected. So it'd be 
reconnecting parts of the forest and reforesting or recanoping that that land that is open. Um, so kind of reestablishing a new forest habitat there um, as part of that. Have you so, looked into the possibility of transplanting those trees? I don't think that, that was, it, I know that that hasn't been looked at. Um, so, so Melissa, when you, uh, when you take a tree out, you, you actually remove most of the root system. Um, and it's very impractical and almost never successful to transplant a large tree, an established tree. Yeah, but you know, uh, we're, I'm not a tree expert. We're not tree experts. Um, with, with that, we will be, there'll be a consultant um, that be working with the, around the project of reforestation, as well as the, you know, uh, tree warden in, in, in Wakefield uh, as well. Any questions uh, around there or any, you know, uh, thoughts about, you know, potentially bringing, um, you know, a statement of support uh, for, from this committee? Is that something we could bring forward for next month? Um, so do you want to put that statement together? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can, you know, draft something and work with whoever here. So it would be... Uh... <laughs> Mostly for getting past the Conservation Commission and uh, that and the 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 state, right? Because we still, you know, there's still two, you know, there's um, the state office environments, um, the legislators. We need a two thirds vote for the legislative body, and then if it passes there, then to the governor's desk to to sign. Um, and we still need to do this in short order as as well, because we are quickly running out of time. Okay. Tom, do you, I know that you don't um, get to control it, but do you have a sense from Conservation Commission on um, when they plan to vote on you guys? Has that we been? We are in front of them uh, in the next meeting. With a potential vote or? Uh, I, I, I hope so. Um, you know, obviously I'm not on that, that committee. Um, okay, just scared. So yeah, is we'll it be worth like drafting something right this moment for a vote. Then, like if if we're not the ones that draft something for the vote, it's you know the, it's them accepting. Oh, sorry, sorry. I meant like if you want us to vote on a statement of the ESC, should we do one real quick right now so that you can bring it to that meeting? Or I mean, if we want, because if we wait till the our next meeting next month, yeah. then you've missed that audience. Uh, um sure if we uh, want. well can i i i wonder because there's a couple of processes here right the the conservation commission is looking at things i'm not sure whether i mean i, I don't know whether they'll be influenced by what we say i i think that it's most important when it gets to the state level to hear from us um not so much the conservation commission so yeah. i don't know tom like i might be wrong about that I mean, I don't know, you know, could, we could use it for, for both. Both, I suppose, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think it's, in, in, in my perspective, right, this is my opinion, um, the, you know, th this body has an opinion on the benefits that the energy park brings to the school, the town, from a sustainability um, environmental aspect uh, of that, you know, which is yeah. the... You know, the the vote being electrified the you know wakefield high being electrified the the solar the you know the uh, capacity the you know annual carbon savings that the the park pro provides from that from a you know environmental standpoint so i'm going to take back what i said i actually think it does i think it does matter so my concern is that it wasn't on the agenda as a potential vote so if there was a public interest of us making a statement I'm not sure this rises to the, when you're allowed uh, to have that urgency of not announcing a vote. So um, I'm apologize, but I, I don't support voting without that being advertised. Let's defer to, you know, let's draft um, something up for, for next meeting and, and vote for that, um, you know, at that point in time. But to, to, to the, the um, gas and light, folks are welcome to attend the conservation committee and speak in their public 
process to say. Oh, yeah, so yeah, there is opportunities for individuals to speak up and support. And maybe next week's or next meeting is all we'll need to hear. I don't know for the comments. Yeah, and if you know, I'll put the plea out. You know, for anyone that wants to speak um, personally around it. Um, you know, at, you know the public uh, portion of that. Uh, feel feel free to to do so. It's maybe a silly question, but does Conservation Commission have public participation because it's not on their agenda? It depends on what type of meeting that they're holding at. It's like I'm looking at their agenda for for next meeting and like the last one we were at did not have public participation. Um, they did allow folks to speak, but that was you know at the discretion of the, the chair. There was no actually open um, public commentary at the beginning of the meeting because I forget what type of meeting it was. It may be the difference of when they call it a hearing versus a continuance or something. There's they follow their. There's unique there. rules that they have to do. But that's not to say if you're not there, there may not be an opportunity just because it doesn't say. Right, I guess this one says, this is the Article 97 land, right? This It just says discussion of proposal by Wake Family and Spill Gas Light Department to swap land under Article 97. Yeah. I, I've, I've heard neighbors have the opportunities to speak on projects when I've just listened in, and I don't know if their agenda would have said it or not. And they have gotten sensitive to not waiting to do it by meeting, but they do it by property. So some people can leave after their properties talked. All right, so next meeting, uh, Tom, if you want to put together a statement, we can vote on um, yep. put on the agenda. Awesome, I appreciate that. And then the only um, other update, I don't know if some folks have seen, um, last week uh, we just um, turned on uh, two new DC fast chargers at the head of the, the lake um, by the park there where um, Frank's um, hot dog stand is there. Uh, the, those are actually fairly unique. Those were actually um, through a, a mass grant. Um, and uh, they actually close a little bit of a um, charging desert on the 95 corridor uh, that was uh, you know, uh, identified there. So helping to, to make that 95 corridor, you know, an alternate fuels uh, corridor. And uh, those chargers are actually uh, paired. Uh, so each charger does uh, uh, 62 and a half kW, but if uh, a car can take more, and it's the first car vehicle there, uh, they will do up to 125 kW. So, you know, uh, potentially a vehicle that can take 125 k um, could be charged in under 10 minutes um, with the, you know, the 80%. And then, you know, scenario is if you are taking the 125, then, you know, car two pulls in, um, it will then, you know, balance that out. You know, each one could get 62 and a half, but they are a little bit smart. So if you're, Car number two can only take 40. Um, car one will get the remainder of that. So car two will take the 40 and then split the, you know, the other one there as, as well. So. So how many public stations do we now have? Um, from uh, oh, town, town owned, we now have three uh, DC fast, uh, the two new ones at the lake. Um, the one on Smith Street in front of Bank of America, which by comparison is also, a, that one is actually a 50 kW, so it's a little bit older model. Um, and then we have the two um, posts of the, the level two for four plugs or, um, you know, four parking spots. Uh, there are other town, you know, other ones in town uh, owned by different entities uh, as well. But the, the town has um, essentially four le uh, level two and three um, level DC fast. I just looked at the charge hub map. I, I noticed those because I live just a few blocks from there. But I looked at the charge hub map and it identifies the spot as Fred's Franks. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And uh, there was some work done there um, just in preparation as well from an electrical standpoint for um, potentially the head of the lake development. So the gas and lake took the opportunity to um, do some pre-work there as well. So 
uh, not to not to digress too much here, but Tom, are, have you seen? You know, you're aware that in Melrose, um, and I'm sure many other places too, but they have like the pole, like the utility pole mounted type. Um, there's one. There's one that I've used um, that I think is pretty cool. I am aware of those. Actually, it's a very unique project um, that Melrose is a kind of uh, POC beta testing for for those through National Grid. Um, those were actually kind of, uh, at the time they were installed, um, they were the first area in the like northeast that those types of units were were being in, installed um, here. So they're a little unique. So I'm aware that you know there's a bunch of different charging technologies um, uh, out there as well, and I those are unique right in terms of i think they give you a lot more flexibility um and you know they're right there where the power is if you put it on a pole so um all right thank you thanks uh so our next meeting is uh february 9th if uh that is works for everybody this point. All right. Um, any matters not anticipated? Okay. Motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Tiana. Aye. Dan? Yes. Julie? Yes. Tom? Yes. Robin? Yes. Ann? Yes. William? Yes. Chris? Yes. And Sean? Aye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.